Hello again, I'm Monsignor Smith. We are uh, considering the moral magisterium of John Paul II. In the segments and the presentations that we've had, uh, we've been looking again at the sum of the enormous doctrinal moral patrimony that the Holy Father has consistently taught in the 19 years he has been Pope. We looked first at some of the fundamentals that are basic to all the applications of moral theology to Christian living. And the last time, uh, we began to look uh, in a more focused way on one particular application, the gospel of life. And I'd like to continue that, uh, but be more specific now, uh, to coordinate what we do here in the uh, gospel of life look at the third chapter which gets specifics. The first had to do with the background, the conditions, the shifts going on, shift in values, shift in perception, changes in attitudes uh, toward life, uh, particularly when it's at risk. And the, the teaching of the Bible, the clear teaching of Revelation, the understanding that uh, in the second chapter that life is always a good and it's a gift, but it's always a good, it's a good gift from a good God. In the third chapter of um, Evangelium Vitae, the Holy Father gets into specifics. Now this is numbers 52 to 57. We can coordinate that, I believe, um, very neatly with the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Because in this case, the fifth commandment, the treatment of both abortion and euthanasia, uh, are very concisely treated in the Catechism. In fact, it may be too concise. The Catechism is a pearl of precision, and there are no wasted words there. However, it is true, some of those words and their definitions need to be provided, and of course, some examples to help make it come alive need to be provided. But the Holy Father um, takes up chapter three of Evangelium Vitae, that is, this, this encyclical on, on the Gospel of Life, and in here he will make three statements of the most formal exercise of his teaching authority that has ever been exercised on these subjects. In their content, I believe they are infallible statements. They're not definitions of dogma, but they are infallible statements with which no believing Catholic can disagree. And the title is Thou Shalt Not Kill. And uh, what he does is cite the Bible as he has all the way through. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And first helps remind us, remember this is his method, always he goes back to the sacred sources, always he goes back to the written scriptures and sacred tradition, that there's a connection, not an opposition. There's a connection between gospel and commandment. Now some people, if they hear gospel, they don't want to hear about commandments. Or if they hear commandments, well, you're not talking about the gospel. No, 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 it's a gospel and a commandment. He says God's, God's commandment is never detached from his love. It is always a gift for man's growth and joy. So that the gospel of life is both a great gift and at the same time a great task. The gift then becomes the commandment and the commandment becomes the gift. And he points out what should be obvious to any believer. We are created. We are created. We are created. If we are created, we are dependent. If we are created, we are not the absolute lords of our own existence. C.S. Lewis had the expression, or at least the question, are you the landlord or the tenant of your existence? If you're the landlord, if you own your life, you can rearrange the rooms and rearrange the building. But if you're a tenant, you can't do that because you don't really own it. And we are the tenants of our existence. Therefore, this great gift from God, and it is a good gift, life, we are ministers of that gift. We're not manipulators. We, are not, we do not have absolute dominion over human life. Only God has absolute dominion over human life. And uh, no, one, no one should try to overreach and uh, play God with someone else's life, including their own life, okay? In number 53, he repeats what I tried to outline in the last thing, which is the basic conviction. Human life is sacred, because it is, from its beginning, it involves the creative action of God, remains forever in a special relationship with the Creator. God alone is the Lord of life from its beginning to its end. Uh, 
And what he's quoting is uh, Donum Vitae, which was an instruction of the doctrinal congregation, Congregation of Doctrine of Faith, 1987. Uh, but always it starts the same way. Human life is sacred because of the connection with God. Human life is sacred. Human life is sacred. We can never forget that. No matter what kind of verbal engineering we run into, no matter what kind of societal shifts or pressures we run into, be convinced, fundamentally, foundationally convinced, that human life is a gift. And again, he reviews for us that sacred scripture tells us, thou shalt not kill. And it gives us uh, a number of examples. And he takes us uh, through those. And uh, of course, that's not just a burden, that's a blessing, because it's good news. It's good news if it's in holy scripture. He takes up the exception that can come about through legitimate self-defense. And someone has a duty, and they have a right to protect themselves against unjust aggressors. That's not what we're talking about, because the moral species of murder is to directly kill the innocent. If someone is aggressing someone else, they're violating their rights. And one has the right to use as much force as necessary, even lethal force, to repel the unjust aggressor. If he or she ceases to aggress, then we leave them alone, or you become the aggressor. And that's a traditional understanding of legitimate self-defense. And he says, we're not talking about that right here. And the catechism does the same thing. He even brings up in number 56, the death penalty, which is a much argued subject in our society. And he makes a statement that's a, a smidgen tighter than what's even in the catechism. Because he argues basically that uh, the extreme of executing an offender, except in what he calls the cases of absolute necessity. But he says today, however, as a result of the steady improvements in the organization of the penal system, uh, such cases are very rare if not practically non-existent. Now, some folks agree with that and some folks don't agree. Some don't think there have been those great improvements in our penal system. But in any case, uh, it, just, uh, it just seems that uh, uh, we, should, we should be careful about thinking that there's some magic bullet to uh, solve all sorts of problems in our society. Uh, the church truly does not rule out the possibility that the state has the right to uh, exercise uh, capital punishment. But its effectiveness is, is highly questionable. If you look in the states that have the most capital punishments in the United States, Texas, Florida, and Georgia, you're going to find out one of them has the highest murder rate in the United States. So as a deterrent, you'd have to say, you know, does this really work? Is this really accomplishing what it says? But in any case, in the old catechism of uh, 1566, in the new catechism of 1992, and in the encyclical, what's stated here is traditional Catholic teaching. And it does not deny that the state can, can, can do this if they are convinced that this is the only way to protect the common good. But again, we're not talking, presumably, about the direct killing of the innocent. The presumption, of course, is that the murderer was not innocent. But the innocent in 1957, and pardon me, in paragraph 57, the innocent person is absolutely inviolable. So any direct lethal assault on any moral innocent this is a species of murder. And it's in that paragraph 57 that the Holy Father makes this formal statement. Therefore, by the authority with which Christ conferred upon Peter and his successors, and in communion with the bishops of the Catholic Church, then he italicizes, I confirm that the direct voluntary killing of an innocent person is always gravely immoral. Now notice how he introduces that. With the authority Jesus Christ conferred on St. Peter and his successors, and John Paul is his successor, in communion with all the bishops in the Catholic Church, if you remember in the last segment, uh, there was near unanimous agreement on all the bishops who went to that, uh, who wrote back to the Holy Father after he asked for suggestions about this encyclical, they agree with him. So the head of the College of Bishops, in union with all the bishops of the Catholic Church, he says, I confirm that the direct voluntary killing of an innocent human being is always gravely immoral, and that the, this teaching is based on sacred scripture, transmitted in tradition, taught by the church in its ordinary universal magisterium. The deliberate decision to deprive an innocent person of their life can never, ever be licit. And therefore, that the right to life, particularly of the innocent, is what he calls inviolable, inviolable. That's a very formal statement. He can't say anything more formal except, I define. Because he's, he's teaching with the charism that Jesus entrusted to St. Peter. 
and to the College of Bishops, and he states that basic principle, it is always wrong to directly kill the innocent. First application is number 58, and that is the crime of procured abortion. Now, procured abortion, Roman documents talk about procured abortion. In the United States, we normally talk about a direct abortion, direct versus indirect, the direct lethal killing of an unborn person. Procured means directly procured. And we only make that distinction to uh, separate it from some cases like if a woman had a cancerous uterus and she was only two months pregnant and the cancer was metastasizing and tarting, there was it's a legitimate application of double effect even in a Catholic hospital. They, they, they could do a hysterectomy there knowing that the un if there's any less radical way to solve it, you'd have to go less radical. But if that's the only way to solve it, we would call that an indirect abortion, not a direct abortion. Similarly with uh, ectopic pregnancies. And again, what the Pope is doing is those exceptions, which are really not direct abortions, they are put aside and he's focusing on, on what is uh, uh, the object of this teaching, namely direct abortion. And he gives us a reminder again that we must call things by their proper name. The reference here goes back to Dominum et Vivificantum, which was his encyclical on the Holy Spirit, number 43. But ultimately the reference there is really to Isaiah 5.20. Because the prophet Isaiah had that passage, woe to those who call evil good and call good evil. Call evil good or call e uh, good evil. And that's the business on the verbal fooling around. And he says, look, we have to call things by their proper name. And he cites uh, the prophet Isaiah. And he warns us against ambiguous terminology. And he gives us examples. He calls one uh, interruption of pregnancy. And he said, terms like that really hide uh, the true nature of what we're talking about. But he says, the moral gravity of procured abortion is apparent in all its truth if we recognize really what we're dealing with is murder. Murder, he calls it. Now, this is the first time since 1930 that a pope has used the word murder. Pope Pius XI in the encyclical Casti Canubii also described abortion as murder. Our American bishops, in a statement they made in April of 1970, which was three years before the high court, that's the only time they use the word murder. But he's going to use the word murder two times here, both on abortion and on um, um, direct uh, euthanasia, which is the same thing. So it's, it's, the, it's the innocent. He makes his appeal to the uh, other people who are involved. There's always got to be a father involved. Even if he disappeared, he's involved. Often a family is involved. Maybe they're not helping, but uh, they should be. Uh, he makes the appeal to doctors and to nurses and to uh, legislators. And he even calls an international network of conspiracy and complicity, which I take it to be Planned Parenthood, which is an international network of complicity that keeps, uh, he says, foundations and associations which systematically campaign for the legalization and the spread of abortion throughout the world. And in many cases, we, are the first world country, have kind of tied this up sometimes with our foreign aid to less developed or differently developed countries. And we keep saying, you know, if you don't do something about your population, uh, we're going to do something about you. And uh, in some cases, that funding gets mixed up with things that our government really should not sponsor and our citizens should not pay for. In number 60, some raise the objection about, you know, when does human life begin? When does human life begin? Is this really a, a, a person or is this really personal life? And without providing any philosophical definitions, uh, the Holy Father cites what the Council said. From the beginning of that time, an ovum is fertilized, a new life is begun, which is neither that of the mother nor the father. And that's true. Genetically, you are different from your mother or your father. You have 46 chromosomes, 23 of which you got from your mother, 23 of which you got from your father. No one else on the planet Earth, unless you have an identical twin, has the same chromosomes as, as you do. And that's really the point. When does individual life begin? When does individual life begin? I think without getting into trouble or without getting into philosophical minefields, if you keep it simple, let's just keep two things clear. Uh, one has to do with life. One has to do with what species? Human. All right? Life. In biology, a living category is distinguished from a dead. You can't be both. If you're alive, you're not dead. If you're dead, you're not alive. So if something is dead, 
Abortion's not the question, nor is euthanasia the question. But if it's a life, it's alive, all right, it's living. The next question again, to what biological category, to what biological species does this life belong? Well, it belongs to the human species. It is the product of human parents, it has human features, it has human chromosomes. No other species has 46 chromosomes as we do. And if you just put those two words together, human and life, is it alive? If not, we're not talking about a moral question. If it is alive, what kind of life? Then it's human life, and it is from the beginning. It was, it's not a canary, it can't be an elephant. Um, our, our human, we all began the same way with that single zygote, which then is repeated in every single cell, every diploid cell in your body has the same chromosomes. And your life is distinct from that of your parents. And that's what I think we mean by a person, someone who is distinct in himself and distinguishable by others. In fact, that's what Webster's Dictionary uh, says. I carry that around because uh, sometimes people challenge that. But they make the point, basically, and, and rather simply, a uh, person, now this is page 1338 of Webster's, an individual human being as distinguished from a thing, a lower in, an individual man, woman, or child. Distinct in itself, distinguishable from others. That's what we mean by a human life. And that begins when you first began. We can't evolve into it or away from it. That's what we are. Sacred scripture, he points out in 61, does not directly mention the word abortion, which is true. And as we mentioned in the last section, the only time it is really mentioned in scripture is in um, the Old Testament, Exodus 21, 22, uh, but it's kind of an accidental one. Uh, but everything else in, humans, uh, in scripture testifies that human life is sacred, testifies that innocent life is inviolable. So the logical deduction of that is this was not a problem in the original Christian community. It was only when the Christians left the Hebrew climate, which was also very pro-life, it's when they went to Athens and when they went to Rome and when they went to Greece and when St. Paul went to Corinth and Thessalonica and all those other places. They had very different attitudes, and therefore the first and oldest document we have is the Didache, the Didache, which was written somewhere between the year 97 and 104, and the Didache is, uh, is actually explicit when it says, you should not kill the unborn by abortion or the newborn by infanticide. So the Holy Father starts to sum up those sources in the church's tradition, and he starts with the the basic pro-life position of the of Revelation, the Didache, the Latin and the Greek fathers, the unbroken teaching of the church, which Pope Paul VI described as this teaching is unchanged and unchangeable. Unchanged and unchangeable. He cites Pius XI and Casti Ganubi, Pius XII, the Second Vatican Council, and the Code of Canon Law, because there is an abortion canon in the Code of Canon Law, Canon 1398. And there's a penalty attached to it in the church's law, that anyone who directly procures an abortion where the effect follows is, um, by that fact, um, cuts themselves off from communion. And that teaching, again, he repeats, is unchanged and unchangeable, uh, which he puts again in its, in its, in its highest form, because he's quoting all of those sources of a 2,000-year uh, unbroken uh, tradition. Uh, and again, he repeats, uh, with the full authority of his office, resting on Holy Scripture, resting on tradition, mentioning both natural law and canon law and all the church's teaching from the year one uh, that the direct killing of the innocent unborn is absolutely immoral and can never be, can never be justified. Uh, the next one he goes, perhaps we have to do a little bit more homework. I, I, I said I was going to coordinate uh, with uh, the catechism, and I failed to do that. Uh, on abortion, uh, the catechism is 2270. So 22, uh, we were looking at Evangelium Vitae, all right? But the catechism is 2270 to 2275. That's very short, very brief. Uh, in fact, it's uh, highly concise. Uh, what I uh, and you, we, we have to, we have to uh, define some of those terms and, and, and spell them out a bit. Uh, but that is coordinated as well. If, if you are familiar with it, in the United States at least, we have what are called the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health facilities. Those are part of the charter. 
uh, the chartered and incorporated purposes of all our nursing homes and all our hospitals throughout the United States. And the directive number 45 and 46 explicitly uh, prohibit abortion in any of our Catholic institutions. And in 1995, the Vatican put out a charter for healthcare workers. And numbers 139 to 146 of that also address the question of direct abortion. The next one that he takes up is the question of euthanasia. And as odd as it sounds, I find that even pro-life people can sometimes get a little bit confused here. So the euthanasia question in, in Evangelium Vitae is numbers 64 to 67. 64 to 67. And the catechism is simply four paragraphs, 2276, 2276 to uh, 2279, which we should read uh, very, very carefully. Uh, because people can get confused. Even good people, even pro-life people can get confused. First, we have to define what we mean by euthanasia. And the Catechism does, as does the encyclical, quoting the Declaration on Euthanasia from the 5th of May, 1980, as any action or omission which of itself or by intention causes death. Now, all four of those elements count. Any action or omission which of itself or by intention causes death. Some people think that only acts of commission, acts of aggression, when delivering the deadly dose, or if you want to go with Kavokian in a carbon monoxide in a Volkswagen van or something, but it is also possible to um, kill someone by omission. So notice the definition says every action or omission, which of itself or by intention. Now, it immediately clarifies for us in 2278, that discontinuing procedures that are burdensome or extraordinary can be legitimate, and that no one no, uh, that people can refuse overzealous treatment because the decision is made by the patient, and if they are competent, and they have the right to do so. Now, this introduces a distinction that we have to look at a little bit because it comes up a lot. Uh, it's called ordinary, ordinary and extraordinary treatment. Ordinary and extraordinary means. Uh, I don't present this as a peculiar Catholic scruple. In fact, I, any, I, I, I teach anything that the Catholic Church teaches. But it just happens that this particular distinction is also perfectly in accord with all other religions that I know of. And also it's, it's in accord with the stated ethics of the American Medical Association. But Although the catechism uses that term and the encyclical refers to it, they don't immediately explain it. So I think we have to try to define this term. What do we mean when we use these terms ordinary and extraordinary means? Ordinary and extraordinary means. Basically, it's a cluster of, of three criteria. Uh, one is positive. Uh, when you ask whether an operation or a treatment or a procedure, does it offer a reasonable hope of benefit to this patient? a reasonable hope of benefit? That's the first positive question. Negatively, does it involve a serious danger of death? Danger of death. You know, if it's 50-50, whether you're gonna come out alive, that's a serious danger of death. Does it involve, thirdly, any excessive? Excessive pain, excessive burden, excessive hardship. Now, if a treatment, a procedure, an operation, or a drug offers a particular patient a, a reasonable hope of benefit without any serious danger of death, without any excessive hardship, excessive pain, excessive burden, then that treatment for that patient is ordinary. If, however, the same treatment for another patient does not offer a reasonable hope of benefit, or it's iffy-iffy if you're going to come out alive. Or it does involve excessive hardship, excessive pain, excessive burden. Then that treatment for that patient is extraordinary. Now the Catholic rule is pretty simple. What is ordinary is obligatory. What is extraordinary is optional. What is ordinary is obligatory. The failure to use an ordinary means is suicidal. Maybe if I give an example, if you have a 
or oh, say a 16 year old girl, she gets pneumonia and they put her in the hospital uh, for a couple of days. They treat it very aggressively with antibiotics and maybe sulfur drugs. Uh, she can be back on her feet in about three days, but it's, it'll be a couple of weeks before her dry cell batteries are back. Now, that aggressive treatment with antibiotics and sulfur drugs, did that offer her a reasonable hope of benefit? Sure it did. You can die of pneumonia. Did it involve a serious danger of death? No, unless she's the one in a million who's allergic to some antibiotic and then you've got to use a different antibiotic. Did it involve anything excessive, excessive burden, excessive uh, hardship? No. So that for her was an ordinary means. That would be, say, we would say, obligatory. In fact, the failure to use, the omission of an ordinary means would be suicidal. Now, take someone else who's not 16, say, say the, well, I was gonna say 97, let's say 57, I'm 57. And uh, you got pneumonia and you got renal failure and you have some cancer problems. And uh, will they treat the pneumonia as, a, as aggressively in the second case as in the first? Well, I've, I've loaded the case. Because if you have renal failure, if your kidneys are not working, they can't pump you up with sulfur drugs or the sulfur drugs will do you in. So in that case, because the circumstances are different, and you say, does it offer a reasonable hope of benefit? No, it would be very harmful for that patient very harmful for that patient. So in one case, it does offer the benefit without any of the negative excessives. In the other case, it doesn't. It's the same treatment. And that's why we say you have to go case by case. Why? Are we changing the rules? No, we're not changing the rules. We are acknowledging the fact that everybody's clinical situation, everyone's health situation, uh, is a little bit different. And therefore, what helps one patient may harm someone else. So. We are committed to apply this principle case by case by case. Even some pro-lifers sometimes they say, well, you know, why don't you write up a list of what's ordinary for everyone, what's extra? You can't do that. Because not everybody has the same diseases. Not every, I mean, uh, somebody who has diabetes and is well regulated on insulin, that for them is an ordinary means. It offers them reasonable hope of benefit and it doesn't involve anything excessive. If someone who doesn't have diabetes, you can't go pumping insulin into them or you're gonna hurt them, okay? So we go case by case by case. And why is that important? That's important because basically this distinction, which is not a peculiar Catholic uh, way of reasoning, in fact, much of it is associated with Pope Pius XII who gave a very famous talk on November 24th, 1957, on the prolongation of life. To be accurate, Pope Pius did not invent that. He did bring an enormous amount of precision and clarity to this distinction. He did. He did, for which he is credited, and properly so. But the distinction's at least 400 years old. Okay? But, and again, it's not just uh, uh, a religious scruple. If you were to look at the um, Code of Ethics, the um, current opinions of the Judicial Council of the American Medical Association, uh, you will find the same distinction. Ordinary, extraordinary. Ordinary is obligatory, because if you don't do what's ordinary, you're really abandoning. And extraordinary is optional. If you want to use an extraordinary means, you're free to. If you want to forego it, you are also free to. And that's what it means in the Catechism when it says, discontinuing medical procedures that are burdensome, dangerously disproportionate and extraordinary. To discontinue an extraordinary means is not euthanasia and has nothing to do with euthanasia. Whereas to discontinue or omit an ordinary means that is euthanasia and it should be so called. And I think that's why in areas where you have to make distinctions and we say, what was the definition? any action or omission. Well, I think where the actions are concerned, uh, usually that's pretty clear, particularly if it's a lethal thing, and you, you know, uh, potassium cyanide uh, has no therapeutic benefits. Uh, it can't help you. It can uh, stop your system in about uh, 15 seconds. Uh, however, actions seem pretty clear, but when it says action or omission, uh, omission is where the problems come up. Because when you hear omission, we must ask the further question. Omitting what? Omitting what? Because it's not immediately clear. The omission of what is ordinary is an act of euthanasia. Whereas the omission of the extraordinary, the non-obligatory, is not euthanasia and it shouldn't be confused with it. 
and the forces of confusion, just like they went through the verbal engineering and the abortion context, uh, they're making the verbal engineering, they're making the air as uh, cloudy as possible in this area, but we shouldn't be, because uh, medical science itself pays very careful attention uh, to this particular distinction, and, and they have to, because uh, very often in medical ethics you get two answers, both of which are wrong. One answer is, you know, what should we do? Do everything. And the other answer is, do nothing. Well, if you do nothing, that's abandonment. That's not medicine, it's not curing, it's not even care, okay? When you say, do everything, do everything that's available on the planet Earth, you might sound optimistic, but actually, that doesn't make sense in certain situations. What we should do, if we distinguish things, is say, do everything that is ordinary, morally ordinary, and leave what's extraordinary as morally optional. If you want to do it, you're free to do it. And if you want to forgo it, you're free to forgo it. But importantly, the Catechism also notes in 2279, the fourth and the last paragraph on euthanasia, it makes the point, even if death is imminent, the ordinary care, now remember, reasonable hope of benefit, without danger of death, without any excessive hardship, burden, whatever, the ordinary care owed to the sick person cannot be legitimately interrupted. The use of painkillers to alleviate suffering of the dying, even at the risk of shortening their days, is morally in conformity with human dignity. Palliative care is a special form of disinterested charity. Palliative care. Palliative care is a, an area of medicine uh, that has been neglected but it's an important area of medicine. Palliation really means uh, pain relief, comfort care. We know there are some cases which presently medical science and our community with all its resources cannot cure or cannot fix. Now what does that mean? Should we abandon people? No, that's the time and the place for us to talk about palliative care. I, I don't insert it because it's personal experience, but it has been my privilege since 1979, I have been on the board of trustees of a, of a hospital. We have a Catholic hospital in the Bronx in New York called Calvary Hospital. Calvary Hospital is a 200-bed facility. Everyone in Calvary Hospital has advanced cancer. Everyone in our hospital is dying. Uh, Calvary Hospital just provides palliative care. We provide pain relief. The rules are pretty simple. You always relieve pain. You always take care of hunger and thirst. You always make someone comfortable and keep them clean. So you always relieve pain. You always take care of hunger and thirst. You always relieve uh, uh, um, hygiene and, and cleanliness. Uh, the, what happens is we get people at Calvary Hospital who have gone to Sloan Kettering or someone else doing through fancy chemotherapy. If it works, God bless them, that's wonderful. But the people who come to Calvary are the ones for whom it did not work. They are literally dying of cancer. Now, our, our philosophy is very clear. Where there is no cure, and temporarily there's no cure there, we still provide care, basic, human, ordinary, palliative care. You relieve pain, you take care of hunger and thirst, you keep someone clean. And we, uh, that hospital next year will be 100 years old. It's perfectly legal, it's perfectly moral, it's perfectly good medicine. And in fact, it and things like it, if the hospice care, if it has a standard of care, in fact, there's a group of sisters, the ones that were founded by Nathaniel Hawthorne's daughter, Rose Hawthorne. The Hawthorne Dominicans in New York have Rosary Hill, which is, has the same philosophy. Everyone has advanced cancer, and they just t take care of that. And that's, that's really the answer to the euthanasia program. Even when you can't cure, you still provide care. Now, is that all the care on the planet Earth? No, all the ordinary care, all the ordinary care, and in this case, in this case, the palliative care. And I was personally happy uh, to see that, the, that the, the, the first mention of palliative care was, was mentioned in the Catechism, and, and the Holy Father takes it up again in, in the encyclical. And that's important because I think some people, they get confused or emotionally depressed, and they say, well, oh, it's cancer, it's the big CA, nothing can be done, nothing. 
It may be in some cases that it can't be cured. That does not mean nothing can be done. Appropriate care, palliative care, can and should be provided. Otherwise, you would be into abandonment. And the Holy Father then goes in Evangelium Vitae, numbers 64, we say, to 67. 64 to 67 is the section on, on, on euthanasia. And he makes the point there have been many advances in medicine and in our cultural context. But the context we live in is often closed to the transcendent. It doesn't see life as a gift from God. And when you close that down, you change the way you value things and the way you view things. And he says the prevailing tendency today is to value life only to the extent that it is pleasurable or well-being. Suffering is an intolerable setback, and in fact, it is senseless. And that's what he meant back there in paragraph 23 of this encyclical when he said we censor, we censor suffering because we don't want to talk about it. Uh, there's been a rightful liberation, but nonetheless we want to be careful about um, um, reducing all sorts of life to only what's meaningful to others. Uh, furthermore, someone who denies or, or neglects the fundamental relationship to God and thinks that he or she is the center of the universe, I am the measure of all things, you know, back to that unguided absolute autonomy thing, obviously uh, they're going to talk themselves into thinking that they have the right to destroy themselves. The point the Pope points out significantly, and it's odd in a way, that the euthanasia movement has made the most progress, quote unquote, I wish it made no progress at all, but it made most, mo where's most progress? In the developed countries. In the developed countries. And uh, that in itself is a little bit surprising, because we would have thought that that would not be the case. After all, we have the most resources, therefore we have and should have resources available to meet basic needs. He says the temptation grows to have recourse to euthanasia, that is to take control of death before its time, to take control. And I think if you check it, you're going to find out that the people who make the most noise about the right to die are their control freaks. They really are. Back in May of 1984, the Governor's Task Force on Life and Law in New York put out a marvelous uh, publication of 217 pages on when death is sought. And it's a very diverse group, but they came to the unanimous conclusion that New York should not change its laws against assisted suicide. So we should keep that as against the law, against the law. And they made a point in there, though, and one of the doctors who was an oncologist said, that he found in his experience that the people who talked most about euthanasia were white, rich, executive, accustomed to being in control. They could not bear the notion of being dependent on anyone else. They could not bear the notion. They could not tolerate the notion of being dependent on someone else. Well, that's really kind of a control freak. And I suppose if we have birth control, why not have life control? Why not have death control? And that control business of the absolute control, that goes back to thinking that you are the master of your own existence, that you are the master of the universe, that you are the abs have absolute dominion. And we don't. We don't. And people who are that obsessed with control, I think psychologists will tell you control freaks are basically out of control. And this is a component of the culture of death. And it's odd, and maybe it's not. Maybe it's significant. Maybe it's, maybe it's sequential that a culture as prosperous as ours should be the cultures, the North Atlantic community basically, that's shifting to the culture of death in terms of efficiency, functionality, and usefulness. We knew from the abortion thing, some of the rhetoric was, well, every child should be wanted. Every child should be wanted. Remember, being unwanted is not a disease. Being unwanted is not a disease. Being unwanted is a value judgment some people make about other people. And listen clearly. If you can have such a thing as an unwanted child, you can have an unwanted grandmother, an unwanted uncle, or an unwanted parent. After all, being unwanted, unwantedness is not an, an illness. It's a value judgment some people make about other people. And that has come home to roost, I think, with a vengeance when we get to the, the elderly who are chronically sick 
and who are in need of uh, basic care, perhaps nursing care. If you go back to that shifting standard from paragraph 23 on efficiency and functionality and usefulness in the judgment of other people, uh, they're not too uh, efficient, they're not too functional, and they're not too useful, and therefore there will be a negative evaluation which, as long as we're talking to each other, obviously we've escaped the abortion tragedy, but we're all candidates for euthanasia. And uh, we want to be careful about those labels about, um, about uh, usefulness and functionality. In number 65 of the encyclical, the Holy Father repeats the definition of uh, euthanasia that came from that declaration in 1980. It appears in the Catechism, but here again, Euthanasia, he says, in the strict sense, is any action or omission which of itself or by intention causes death. He says, we must distinguish this from the effort to forego aggressive medical treatment as we were trying to distinguish before. We must distinguish that from, from, ex, from extraordinary treatment, extraordinary means, extraordinary procedures, because if someone wants to stop that, you know, you might start one of those things and hope that it works, and then you reach a point where, gee, it hasn't worked. In fact, it's causing more trouble than it's worth at this point. But if it's truly extraordinary and it's offering no real reasonable hope of benefit, and it is inflicting terribly invasive hardships on someone, then that, for them, is an extraordinary means. They can forego that. That has nothing to do with euthanasia. That's allowing a disease process to progress because actually, you can't reverse it. You might slow it down, but you can't reverse it. And we're not obliged to a standard that is too high. Again in 65, he says, in modern medicine, increased intention has been given to methods of palliative care. That'll be mentioned again in number 88 of this encyclical. And again, I'm very glad to see that because sometimes everybody seems to know what the Catholic Church is against. And uh, I don't know why, but uh, no one ever seems to know what they're for. And they should know that we're for proper care. We're for proper care of the elderly, for proper care of the sick, even the terminally ill. And there is a way to care for them properly. Not super duper machinery, not all sorts of uh, um, technological invasions that may accomplish nothing or become futile or perhaps even redundant but we all owe basic ordinary care to every human being made in the image and likeness of God, certainly to relieve pain, certainly to take care of hunger and thirst, certainly to keep people clean. And the Pope praises those uh, who work in that field and even those who accept their human suffering and try to join it with the suffering of, of Jesus and uh, offering that that way. Now, many of our secular Contemporaries see no point in that at all. Uh, but then you come back to the philosophical problem of pain or the philosophical problem of even the first place, and uh, it, uh, the Pope is right. Uh, the Christian understanding of suffering uh, is an important perspective because without it, uh, people can become too easily depressed, I'm, I'm afraid. But he makes the point that there's nothing wrong in its conventional teaching to take drugs for pain relief no one says that you have to, that, uh, that it's good to suffer. In fact, if people take drugs for pain relief, even if they shorten their life somewhat, even if they lessen their consciousness somewhat, but sometimes that pain relief allows them to think, allows them to talk with loved ones and relatives, it allows them to pray, even if it has some, by way of double effect, negative consequences. But again, it's not a direct killing. And after he makes the appropriate distinctions, he comes back. I said that there were the three big statements. There was the one in 57 on the direct killing of the innocent. There was one in 62 on direct abortion always being wrong. And here in number 64, he says, taking into account these distinctions in harmony with the magisterium of my predecessors, in communion with all the bishops of the Catholic Church, now he italicizes, I confirm that euthanasia is a grave violation of the law of God since it is a deliberate and unacceptable killing of the human person. This is based on the natural law, the written word of God, the church's tradition, the church's magisterium. Depending on circumstances, suicide or it has the malice of suicide or murder. So he used it again. But again, this is very formal, very formal. He invokes the magisterium of his predecessors. What he's saying is all the popes have gone before him together with all the bishops of the Catholic Church today, so that the head of the college and all the members of the College of Bishops, and he's resting it on God's revelation, on the natural law, which is God's creation, and on the church's own tradition. 
suicide and assisted suicide he takes up. And su assisted suicide is the one that seems to be troubling us in the United States. Uh, why so? Well, technically, uh, suicide in the United States, most states don't have laws against suicide. Or if they do, there's no penalty. Obviously, if someone commits suicide and they succeed, the penalties are irrelevant. If someone attempts suicide and they do not succeed, they don't belong in jail. They need help, they need a cup of coffee, they need a friend, they, they need to see some light at the end of the tunnel. However, two-thirds of our states do have laws against assisting a suicide. Assisting a suicide. This is why the famous Dr. Kavokian went to Michigan, because Michigan is one of the states that doesn't have such a law. Now, and that's the soft underbelly of the uh, euthanasia movement, to try to detoxify or defang or take the teeth out or the penalties out, they call it decriminalization, to remove the penalties from the uh, assisted suicide statute. So what our law is saying, and it's a good law, is that uh, people, professionals, especially doctors, and no one else, no one has the right to kill someone else. And that's really what assisted suicide does, and that's really what it means. But it's usually, it's usually cloaked in the language of compassion. And uh, juries, juries very, very rarely go after people if they think they acted out of compassion. If it was malice or inheritance or greediness or viciousness, juries can take on the nature of sandpaper. Uh, but if it's compassion, it gets a little muddy. But the Holy Father, uh, again now in number 66 of Evangelium Vitae, uh, points out something that's important theologically and etymologically. He says, many people call euthanasia mercy killing. He says, it is a false mercy. It is a false mercy. In fact, he says, it is a perversion of mercy. Why so? Because true compassion, true compassion, true compassion means what? Suffer with. Passio. Passio means to suffer. Cum means with. He says, true compassion leads to shoulder or share another's pain. It does not mean you kill the person who's suffering you can no longer bear. And he's right. Compassion is a marvelous virtue, and it is a great virtue. But really, what does it mean? It means to suffer with. It means to shoulder. If two people pick something up together, it only weighs half as much. And we always admire people, admire people men and women, of, of real compassion. But he says, if you look at this closely, this is really a false mercy. Because what's happening is not that you're willing to share, sometimes only by your presence, sometimes only by your words, sometimes only by your visits, the nursing and medical um, experts can, can provide the technical parts, but we know from Calvary Hospital it's not all just technology. A lot of it has to do with, a lot of it has to do with attitude. And if in fact what is the matter is we can no longer suffer with someone else's sickness because it's a burden to me, the Pope is right. Haven't we recycled the language? We admire compassionate people because they help those who are suffering the burden. But if we scramble the eggs there and run it back that, well, gee, they're really a burden to me, don't call that compassion. That's not true mercy. It's false mercy. And in fact, you're not really telling the truth. You're not telling the truth. True mercy, he says in 67, is the same way as true love. It is companionship. It is sympathy. It is support. And companionship is, is very important, and it's an important form of witness. It's an important form of witness. Remember, in the beginning, he said, one of the problems, one of those adjutants that helps create the culture of death is isolation amid difficulties. Isolation amid difficulties. The first application we saw was, well, perhaps the, uh, the unwed mother who is pregnant or the, the wedded mother who has an unwanted pregnancy, if she gets isolated, her difficulties increase greatly. Here, almost by definition, we have succeeded, I think in an obscene way, of banishing most elderly people from our media or from television, 
or if they come on with silver white hair, they're usually treated as fools. And because of mobility, people moving around, some are isolated. And in that isolation, difficulties increase. And if that isolation is caused by physical impairment, which family members, loved ones, neighbors can't take care of, and someone is placed somewhere, that isolation is not cured by euthanasia. It's not cured by killing. That isolation can over become, uh, be overcome by companionship. And uh, I think it's good that in some of these confirmation programs where they have the little kids doing projects, uh, they should try to link them up, get a pen pal with someone who's in uh, one of the homes for the elderly. And the Italians are very wise people. They always put the oldest members of the society with the youngest. Why? Because the old people tell the same stories over and over, and the young ones ask the same questions over and over. So by God's design, they belong together. But when we isolate people and shunt them off, and it becomes not so much a nursing home or a facility, but more like a warehouse, they turn in on themselves. That exaggerates their difficulty. If they have a terminal illness or they're chronically ill, certainly there is a problem there. There is a problem there. Uh, but that problem is not cured by killing. We should never allow the medical profession, even if elements of itself lead the charge in the wrong direction, we can never allow, nor can we afford, to allow the medical profession to become professions of killers. That's not its purpose, and it's really a disaster. There's a sad little piece of history that has come back to haunt us with a vengeance. People, um, we, we see in contemporary the Netherlands, where uh, uh, euthanasia is technically against the law, but it's practiced, because uh, a doctor has to report himself to five uh, provincials, attorneys general, and say uh, he has to report himself. So anyone who doesn't report himself doesn't get in. There's an ironic piece of history here. Back in 1940, when the Netherlands was invaded by the Nazis, Arthur Seiss Imquart, who was the Gauleiter of the Netherlands, and he was a real Nazi, he was there about two weeks, and he ordered all the Dutch doctors to fill out five-page forms on all their patients to find out who was worthy for the workforce, who was worthy for the workforce. And on page two of this long questionnaire, it said, did you have any inherited diseases? Now, to their credit, no Dutch doctor filled out one of those forms. Then pressure was applied to them. In fact, some of them were arrested. All the physicians in Holland went down to the post office within two weeks and handed in their license and said that they could not practice medicine because they had no license. Of course, they continued to take care of their patients throughout the occupation. To their credit, to their eternal credit, not a single Dutch physician cooperated with the Nazi euthanasia program in Holland. Not one of them. In what we must describe as some of the most horrendous circumstances in human history. Today, in a country at least as free as ours is, Holland, some Dutch physicians do voluntarily what their predecessors in medicine refused to do under very difficult circumstances. Do, 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 we, do we learn anything from history? So in this business of the culture of death, this shift, this move from a standard of individual worth, which really deserves respect, generosity, and service, to this new so-called standard of efficiency and functionality and usefulness. Try not to be confused. Be not confused by the terminology, the verbal engineering, the language, because it's important we not contribute to the confusion by becoming confused. But also don't be confused by some of the, the, the promos that say, well, you know, society has, technology has advanced so much that no one knows what to do. That's not true. Our doctors and nurses, they do know what to do. They do know what's appropriate, what's ordinary, what's extraordinary, and everything else. And we want to make sure that our attitudinal shift is one that contributes to the culture of life, the culture of life, to move from indifference to concern, from rejection to acceptance, to love people for their own sake and to enrich them by their presence. Even when they're dying, their presence can enrich us and your presence can enrich them. No one ever has to kill anyone, but we can all provide care and sometimes 
that care involves standing there silently and holding someone's hand. That contributes to the culture of life.